Okay, so we're still on um, this question of, of, of police violence and social control. And this is the, the second of the two videos. And um, the first just uh, looked at uh, the US uh, uh, police training and general issues around violence uh, and the state giving itself permission to use certain kinds of violence through the police or other entities. Um, now we're really focusing on the current topical issue of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and I want to start um, by reading to you uh, and, and look at your slides as the full text is in your slides and the slide is called man dies after medical incident during police interaction and this is an official police state uh, public statement that it was a press release from the Minneapolis Police Department on May the 25th of 2020. On Monday evening shortly after 8 p.m. officers from the Minneapolis Police Department responded to the 3700 block of Chicago Avenue South on a report of a forgery in progress. Officers were advised that the subject was sitting on top of a blue car and appeared to be under the influence. Two officers arrived and located the subject, a male believed to be in his 40s, in the car. He was ordered to step from the car. After he got out, he physically resisted officers. Officers were able to get the suspect into handcuffs and noted he appeared to be suffering medical distress. Officers called for an ambulance. He was transported to Hennepin County Medical Center by ambulance, where he died a short time later. At no time were weapons of any type used by anyone involved in this incident. The Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension has been called in to investigate this incident at the request of the Minneapolis Police Department. No officers were injured in the incidents. Incident. Body ca worn cameras were on and activated during this incident. The GO number associated with this case is 20-140629. Okay, so there we have a very neutral um, uh, description of a, a of, of the police being called in. A crime was being uh, had had been committed. Uh, um, performing an arrest in which the suspect seems to have suffered some sort of medical, um, or well, a medical incident in the words, and then, and then later dies. Um, and we should worry about that. We should, we should worry about this particular press release. Um, how was it possible? Because of course, what this press release is referring to, and this is assuming you have watched the eight minutes, 46 seconds video now, and if you haven't watched that, you need to go back and watch it before listening to the rest of this lecture because the lecture doesn't make sense without it. Um, what that press release is to referring to is the openly public torture and murder of George Floyd, uh, a murder that was captured, um, was witnessed by members of the public, was captured on video, that uh, video has been released and circulated, okay? And what is so striking is the kind of gap, the gap between the actual footage of the officers forcing him to the ground, um, the officer for nearly nine minutes leading, kneeling with his knee on George Floyd's neck, suffocating him to death while he pleads for his life. The striking contrast between that actual footage, the actual words, the continual repetition of the words, I can't breathe, versus the description in this official police report of uh, the arrest was successfully performed, but the suspect seemed to suffer a medical incident. Okay. It's precisely the gap between the words and the images that we need to do our thinking. Um, so the first thing about that, the first thing about that press release is not, not that it was worded in that way, but that but that they did it, that, 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 that they made, that they, they, they willfully released that press statement 
which seems to imply that they thought it would be an okay thing to do. They thought, like they literally thought they would get away with it. They thought that the police uh, description would be the last word on the matter. It would be the one that would be believed by the media and the courts. Um, because obviously releasing it, knowing that the public knows that it is what actually happened was completely at odds with that account, doesn't serve them at all well. Um, in fact, I mean, it makes them look, simply makes them look like liars. Um, and that that wasn't factored into the press release. The idea that, 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 that they are simply deliberately misrepresenting the effects to deceive the public and to cover up not simply a crime, but a, the crime of torture and murder um, seems to seem to all be lost here. And how did it get lost? That's, that's the question. Okay. Now, firstly, Black Lives Matter didn't start in 2020. It didn't start with the death of, of George Floyd. It goes, it goes way back. It, 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 and and um, the history of Black Lives Matter had, it, it is a, already a history of people protesting the murder of African Americans by the United States police. Um, but Black Lives Matter is conditional. It emerges because a particular piece of technology emerges. Black Lives Matter can only exist because a, 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 tech, a, a new technology exists. And that technology is, is essentially um, mobile phones with video recorders in them. That, that citizens can now um, actually document incidents. Uh, and why is that so important? Why is the ability of citizens to visually document incidents so important? And when you go back, you look at the, the, the one of the sort of landmark cases in the history of protest against police brutality was the beating of, of Rodney King. And once again, that's shown in the um, 8 minutes 46 seconds documentary, that he was savagely beaten by the Los Angeles police, who were then acquitted uh, from using of using excessive force, of course. I mean, despite it, the undeniable <laughs> visual evidence that they were beating a man who was lying face down on the ground, um, they were acquitted by the courts of using excessive force. Um, but the Rodney King case was one of the first cases, and this was pre-mobile phone era. This is someone actually holding literally a video camera, like a home video camcorder and recording the police at a distance. But not everyone is carrying a video camera around. Everyone's carrying a, a digital camera around in their phones. And so the big change is not that police violence has escalated. The change is the public now have means of documenting it. Um, and previously, um, you know, the pub public could give verbal reports. They could, they could go to court as witnesses and say, yes, I saw the cops doing this. But those verbal reports would simply be denied. And it would be the testimony of the police officers, uh, consistent testimony of police officers against dissenting testimony of the public. And the court simply believed the police and not the public. And so did the media. The media would tend to just, you know, uh, ask the cops for a description of events and use that to tell their story. Um, they were very reluctant to do proper investigative journalism to actually go out and get the stories of the victims, particularly if those victims were minorities, particularly if they could then be legally attacked for having misrepresented the police. Um, uh, and the, once again, the police, um, you know, if, 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 if they give a consistent account of a particular event and, and members of the public give another account, the, the courts historically have tended to believe the cops, not citizens. Um, and, this is, and this is why in, in, in sort of totalitarian societies, um, th there are often laws against filming the police. This is one of the most contested rights, the right to actually film police officers. Or sometimes there are even laws against um, reporting, like the, the newspapers are literally not allowed to describe the activities of police officers um, in totalitarian systems. So the right to observe and report and to record 
the activities of the agents of the state is a, is a, is a fundamental one uh, in an accountable democracy. So the history of, of state violence against African Americans, I mean, this is a, this is an, 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 a totally normalized history that has always officially been denied. And of course, I mean, the, the mere existence of African Americans is by, by violence. And these, these are people who were slaves. They were literally kidnapped from another continent, uh, kept as slaves um, before being freed. And, and, and as the Bowling for Columbine uh, documentary so clearly shows the shift from the end of slavery to new forms of violent control against African American people was was a was a very clear one, and the way in which the media is implicated in representing particularly black men as 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 threatening and dangerous, and how the sort of accounts of police violence against black men um, is 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 a, a, plugged into that tradition, plugged into the idea, well, this is a social group that are intrinsically dangerous and threatening, and it's necessary for the state to be violent against them. These are the, these are the kind of historical claims. So, so it's a double, interesting kind of a double claim, both that the violence isn't happening, a denial of it, that, you know, black people aren't being, they aren't being lynched, they aren't being assaulted, they aren't victims of, of, of rampant police brutality. At the same time, well, police brutality is necessary because they are a particularly violent subgroup in the population. They're particularly threatening. Um, and, and, and so the, the sort of rhetoric tries to have it both ways. The violence isn't happening and the violence is justified at the same time. Um, and of course, the, you know, there's a real problem in any society where there's a convergence between the media, the courts, um, and, 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 um, and, and the interests of, of the of the sort of dominant groups in society against minorities, um, that leads to both the denial of violence against minorities, but also the justification of violence against minorities. Um, and critical to this is this tendency of the police um, that's, that is so clearly outlined in the, um, in the article I was discussing in the previous video, the, the police to protect each other. There's a strong, strong sense that the police ha only have each other to protect each other. And one of the ways in which they protect each other is not just sort of shooting people who are threatening them, but also lying for each other, covering, covering up each other's use of violence, where they agree amongst themselves that use of violence was necessary. Um, and the courts may not agree with that, and the media may not agree with that, the public may not agree with that, so it's okay to lie about it. It's okay to deceive the courts, the media, and the public, because they really know that in their job, that kind of violence is necessary. So this kind of uh, um, conspiracy of the police um, to not be accountable for their acts of violence. Um, and this then plugging into the way in which um, the media um, often either don't bother to look at victim experiences or simply are interested in representing the experiences of those who are in privileged positions in society rather than those who are in precarious positions in society. Um, and um, one of the things we can look at, and this is discussed in that article on the past exonerative tense, this is like a really a kind of a grammatical term to describe a way of speaking. It's not just the, the, the lies, um, it's the ways of speaking. Um, and, and that article gives a number of examples. For instance, it, 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 it gives this quote from one of the mayors. Um, officers involved in the arrest of a man who died after being handcuffed and pinned to the ground by an officer's knee had been fired. Okay. And what's interesting here is you look at that, and on one level you can say, yes, that is accurate. He did die after uh, being handcuffed and pinned to the ground, but he didn't die after that. This is the critical difference. He died as a result of that. And that's what the language conceals, okay? And that's precisely what the official police account is designed to con conceal, that he was arrested and then there was a medical incident. Yes, both true. He was arrested, factually correct. There was a medical incident, factually correct. But of course, the lie is what is not said that the medical incident was a result 
a direct result of deliberate sadistic torture during the arrest. And it was a result of the deliberate withholding of the me medical attention, the deliberate non-release from the chokehold, even once he was unconscious. Um, and, and so it's what is not there rather than what is there, where the dishonesty and corruption and violence lies. Another quote, Minnesota authorities say that the police officer who knelt on George Floyd's neck has been arrested. Okay, once again, the word knelt, technically correct, he did kneel on his neck. But once again, the word kneel, I mean, this is a thing that people do, you know, as part of a religious devotion. It's a kneeling is often a gesture of submission, you know, kneel in front of someone. Um, and so the word knelt specifically defuses the violence. And, and so the, the notion of kneeling rather than, than describing it as a chokehold, rather than saying he was suffocated by a chokehold, that he was tortured, that he was suffocated to death. Those are the words that are missing. And instead, this word kneeling, this is the, 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 the sort of gentle, submissive notion of kneeling um, uh, is used. Uh, another quote, before he died after being pinned for minutes beneath, beneath the Minneapolis police officer's knee, um, and, and, and once again, they, he was pinned for minutes, um, as if this was an accident, the pinning simply happened. Uh, and, 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 and here we see the thing that's happened in all of these quotes. The causality is what is erased. That the events are described, but the nature of the events, the causal relation between the events is what is omitted. And that's, and that's what at absolute minimum, the criminal neglect to attend to someone's safety. But in fact, what is very clear from the video is not simply criminal neglect, but active cruelty. Um, and an act of violence that, 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 that in fact constituted torture and murder. All of that is, is, it disappears under this language. But what's interesting about the language is that the language is not in the first instance simply factually incorrect. Uh, you know, in court they could say yes, but, but that is, we were simply trying to describe it neutrally. But it's precisely the claim to neutrality that actually leaves out what is actually taking place. And it leaves it out by omitting the relationships between the events. So it describes sort of delinked processes and events. It describes them without reference to either the motivation or the effects of those events. So, so it pretends to claim to uh, objectivity and neutrality. But what it's actually doing is it's misrepresenting. It's, it's, it's clearly, deliberately, dishonestly misrepresenting uh, acts of violence in order to acquit the perpetrators. Um, and it's important we look at that. So in looking at that press statement, the way it, it was designed to acquit the perpetrators, but also that they thought they would get away with it. The assumption that they've always gotten away with, with misrepresenting the acts of violence, and they would get away with it this time. And, and part of the rage is not simply against the acts of violence, but against the, against the lies, against the consistent misrepresentation, denial, the victim blaming, blaming the victims of those violence, of that violence, and constructing them as the perpetrators. Uh, and this is one of the things I'm really interested in us looking at today, is the representations of the acts, not just the acts, but but how they are talked about. This is a major theme of the last few weeks. How do, how, how do different acts of violence get represented, get imagined, get talked about in the media, in courts, in the minds of the public? And another aspect of Black Lives Matter is, the, is, is that there, there, there's a, there's a, there's, there are competing representations of the uh, protests against police brutality. And these follow two, two kind of two broad themes. The one is the, the, that, that, that these protests are, are, are violent, antisocial anarchists trying to undermine law and order and damage society. And the other is that this is a, um, a, a vulnerable group that are being denied their basic human rights and are protesting for justice as, as anyone in a democratic society should be allowed to do. Okay, so on the one hand, we have this idea these, 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 these are kind of crazed uh, people 
bent on social destruction for its own sake versus uh, people who are simply exercising their democratic right to try and seek basic social justice. Okay, um, so how do these two contrasting accounts work? Well, firstly, we've got to think of our media, our media theory, and 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 the idea of um, newsworthiness. Like, how does the media report, and what does it report? We've talked about all this before. We talked about it reference to Apex. You've talked. You, you you're well acquainted with your theory of moral panics. Okay. Well, the first thing, the media focus on the most extreme events. So they focus on stuff that, that is visually striking, that is shocking. So if, if a police car burning, shop windows being smashed, um, rather than people simply s sitting in protest for three hours uh, singing, um, the, 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 that, that part of the protest is, 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 is uninteresting from a media marketing point of view. The, someone throwing rocks at the, cop and the cops and the cops shooting back, that, that's the kind of five-second image that is going to sell media. So the, so the media make it look like things are much more um, violent and destructive than they really are. Um, and so they're going to focus on the extreme acts of destruction of property and looting. Okay. The other thing, the media, and this is why the documentary is so important, why the documentary is different from the, the sound bites in the media. But because the news media focus on sound bites, they can only include a certain amount of information. And, and of course, it's the, it's the triggering information, it's the shocking information, but it's the decontextualized information. So they can show um, acts of violence, acts of damage to property, acts of looting, but they can't explain them. And, and that's why it's so important to have an hour length documentary where someone sits down and says, wait a minute, instead of having 10 little flashes, what we need is we need to we need to think. We need to have space to assemble all the information. We need to look at this thing. Where did this come from historically? We need to interview people uh, from different perspectives. We need to get them to explain how they're thinking about what's happening. We need to see the stuff that 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 isn't just the 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 the, the shocking media moments. Um, but the but but the nature um, of of not only the kind of formal news media, but social media is, is by only allowing these fragments, it doesn't allow an analysis. And so the work is left for us as the kind of social researchers to then do the work of, of, of the analyst and saying, wait a minute, underneath these shocking images, this is what's really going on. The other thing is that the media, of course, they tend to rely on official accounts, as we talked about before, rather than the victim's experience. Um, and so they'd be often just, you know, getting the, the official press release. And, it's, and, and, you know, the media agencies like, have got on speed dial the number of the police public relations desk. They don't necessarily have on speed dial um, the, the, the people taking part in the protest. Perhaps the protest doesn't have any organizational leadership or representatives. It's just people. All the organizations are not well known and recognized. Um, uh, another factor is that the actual physical positioning of the media, um, that often in order to, to position themselves as safe, the media position themselves behind the police lines. And so they actually see the events from the standpoint of the police rather than from the standpoint of the protesters. And one of the interesting things that happened is, and this happened to an Australian news crew even in the Black Lives Matter protests, is that they, that they were taking the stand. They were filming from the perspective of the protesters and they were attacked by the police, even after identifying themselves as being media outlets. Um, the police assaulted them, and they were, and we also see it, and the police arresting journalists um, live on air. They're like journalists are busy reporting, and the police start arresting them. Which, of course, that's a that that's something that we don't want to see in a democratic system. That that freedom of the press, freedom to report on, uh, especially the sort of corruption and violence of of of, of authorities, is something that is an is an essential right. In a democratic system. So when the police start assaulting and arresting um, news reporters, the, something very serious, a very serious blow has been struck against democracy. 
Um, and it was interesting to see those being, being represented. Um, of course, the other thing is that the media often just represent the views of, the, of, of those in power in society. Um, the, the media are commercial enterprises. Um, they owned by business interests. They, they, they are often representatives of the dominant social groups. And so they see the world from the, from the, rep, from the standpoint of those social groups and that they represent the world in a way that converges with the interests of those economic and political powers, um, because if they didn't, they would find themselves out of a job. So we have these conflicting accounts. We have, we have this, um, the, this, the, the focus on the destructive aspect of the protests. Um, and, and, and the function of that then is to delegitimize them. And it becomes really, really interesting and problematic um, uh, because one of the complicated things of the Black Lives Matter protest is it was known that in fact, right wing, uh, sort of white supremacist and libertarian groups were actually deliberately joining up with those protests and deliberately using them uh, as a moment to to engage in acts of violence, engage in acts of, of destruction of property, and, and in and at least one case for murdering a police officer. Um, um, and it was done deliberately in order to provoke racial antagonism to fit with their um, political agenda of trying to start a race war. And the Boogaloo movement uh, is particularly kind of at the heart of this, uh, a kind of a, 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 an extremist white supremacist group that, that, is, that is pushing for social confrontation and, and actually trying to stoke up a race war in order to kind of release um, violence against marginalized people. Um, but within that, of course, there are, there, there, there are also just um, people make, for no political reason, ma yet making use of the cover of the protests um, to commit criminal acts, and of, and people who who are engaging in acts of destruction of property and theft as political acts, as a way of 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 pushing back against generations and centuries of disenfranchisement, of economic exclusion, um, and and thus politicizing what are what, what are then perceived and represented in the media as simple criminal acts. So, 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 so in fact, it's, there's, a, there's a really complex convergence of things going on. But the, these get simplified into, into these two narratives, that these are, these are just like anarchists. And the word anarchist is not seen as being an actual political position, but simply meaning, you know, like people who just want to destroy stuff, who just want to break society, rather than people who are, concerned with the, the, the um, decentralization of power and the um, enhancing of autonomy uh, within society, which is politically what anarchism is really about. Um, um, okay, so um, there we need, to, we need to look beyond these simplistic narratives um, of, the, um, of, of the protests. And one of the things we need to do, which the, the, the video is so important in doing, is to contextualize them historically, but also to provide a kind of contemporary context. And one of the, the things, if you look at the, the slide of US police kill civilians at a much higher rate than police in other wealthy countries, and notice the wealthy countries there, not higher than all other countries. They're countries where, where, with, uh, with staggeringly higher rates of police uh, um, killing civilians. Uh, but often they're countries in highly repressive countries, um, undemocratic countries, countries where, there's, where, where there are totalitarian governments, where the police are the enemy of the citizens and, and simply a brutal force of repression. Um, but not in all cases. But in the United States, you see sort of way leading the pack with Canada um, and Australia quite far behind, but still very, very high. So we see that, in fact, police killing of civilians is actually much higher in Australia than it is in, in, in most European countries and countries like um, Japan. Um, and that requires some explanation. Although it's, it's far lower than the United States, it's equally far higher than, than most European countries um, and much higher than even New Zealand. So we need to think about that. Um, 
But one of the th interesting things is, is, is within, that, within that statistic, uh, the, 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 that, and, and in fact, it amounts to about 1,000 killings a year. The, the United States police kill about 1,000 people a year. That's three a day. That's a, that's a lot of killings. Um, and what's interesting about that is when you break it down, most of the people who are killed are white. They're white Americans simply because most Americans are white. Um, that less African Americans than European Americans are killed. Um, but proportionally, African Americans are killed at a much, much higher rate than European Americans. Um, and that's the critical difference. So European Americans, if you, if you break it down, not by country, but by ethnic category, European Americans are, uh, aren't, aren't, aren't murdered at higher, are killed at higher rates than, than, than perhaps people in, in most European countries, but nothing like the enormous rate that um, African Americans are killed. And so that breakdown is really important. The other thing that's so significant is that there used to be no means of gathering this, this data. And that was, of course, deliberate, that until um, Obama introduced a specific mechanism, there was no gathering of, 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 of police killings of civilians. And, and that's extraordinary, because the one thing the police do really well is, is gather numbers about crimes. I mean, the one thing the police do, they can tell you exactly how many r burglaries and uh, um, how many homicides there've been. Um, they, they, there's a detailed breakdown of all the crimes that are committed, the patterns, where they're going up, where they're going down, where they're worse, where they're better. But, but the one thing that was, was, was kind of totally omitted, the single pattern of criminality um, and of violence that was, was admitted was the death of, um, of civilians at the hands of police. And, and that's not an oversight, that's deliberate. So that had to be changed. Um, um, and of course, then the question of the interpretation of those deaths is the really difficult one. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in response to that, in response to this, 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 this massive incident of uh, killings of African Americans by police, Black Lives Matter emerges. It emerges through the fact that suddenly these deaths are being documented. Suddenly we can actually see videos of people being killed, um, uh, starting with Rodney King going right through to um, George Floyd. We can actually see how the, 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 the beatings and tortures and murders are taking place. And, 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 that, that, and that then politically mobilizes people. But at the same time, there's this counter mobilization. There's two sort of counter uh, movements, uh, all lives matter and blue lives matter, that, are, that then sort of mobilize politically against uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And what's interesting is that these don't exist prior to Black Lives Matter, that, that they are responses. So there was no All Lives Matter movement. There was no movement saying, well, everyone's vulnerable to police violence. Um, th there was no concern about, about the way in which there's a general vulnerability to police violence in the United States prior to the emergence of Black Lives Matter. It's only at the point that Black Lives Matter specifically articulates the, 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 the racist pattern intrinsic in police brutality in that society, that All Lives Matter then sort of invents itself. And its claim is an interesting one. Its claim is that it's an anti-racist um, movement. It claims that Black Lives Matter is racist simply because it identifies Black Americans as being more vulnerable, and it, and it claims to be anti-racist by saying, but all people are vulnerable to police um, violence, which of course is a, it's a pretext. It's a, it's a very, very obvious pretext. The question is, how does it make itself, how does it attempt to make itself plausible? And one of the things it does is um, through this kind of statistical illiteracy, and this is how fake news often uh, works. It, it, it takes some sort of data, some scientific findings, but because there's no grasp of the meaning of that data or those findings, it then interprets them in a, 
in a scientifically and statistically illiterate way. And, the, and in this case, it's the fact that m more European Americans are killed than African Americans by cops. Um, but, the, but the illiteracy behind that is the fact that proportionally, uh, European Americans are actually at, at very low risk, um, whereas African Americans are very high risk of being killed in police encounters. Also that the nature of the encounters is different. Bear in mind that that's, you know, the, the um, fatal encounters with the police range from like people opening fire on the police with assault weapons and getting shot through to people um, trying to buy something using a fake $20 note, as in the case of George Floyd, or uh, someone selling, illegally selling loose cigarettes on the street corner, um, or someone just walking home from a shop. Um, that the, the that the the conditions of those killings are are, are fundamentally different. That the the, the degree to which um, the police use lethal force when absolutely no uh, even approximate uh, use of extreme force was necessary is is fundamentally racially different, and it's seen so clearly in you know, incidents like Dylan Roof who, had, who who was arrested after literally going into a church and killing eight people with an automatic assault rifle the police arrested him without any violence at all um, there was no i mean they, they didn't storm in and shoot him um, they 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 worked out how to de-escalate the situation so that they could so so that they could they could arrest this this mass murderer without even um hurting him at all let alone using lethal force against him. And, that, that, and that's sort of emblematic of the fundamental uh, kind of racial contrast between the exercise of force. Um, and that's also what's being, the attempt is to erase that. Um, and, but it's part of a much larger process, which is a process of denying the experience of vulnerable groups. That, that this is a standard kind of thing that dominant groups do that they erase the experiences of vulnerable groups. And when, and when groups, who, whoever it is, experiences of women, um, uh, gender minorities, ethnic minorities, um, uh, economically excluded and vulnerable people, that those, ex those experiences are, 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 tend to be systematically denied and erased. And, and whenever they are asserted, then the, the, the kind of the viewpoint of the dominant group is asserted against them. And one of the interesting thing with the kind of resurgence of sort of internet-based um, kind of right-wing authoritarian viewpoints is, is this repeated claim that in fact it's the, it, it, it's that, 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 that the racism is in the, is, is, is from the people who are trying to raise the problem of racism saying, well, please stop shooting black people, and that's the racism. Or please stop beating up gay people. That's that's where the the trouble starts. Um, that if if minorities and people who are being uh, victims of violence, if they would just shut up, then everything would be fine, like it always used to be. Everything was much better for the dominant group when. When, when minorities knew their place and didn't speak about their suffering and didn't speak about their victimization. Now that they are speaking about it, that's actually the problem. The problem isn't, isn't, the, it, it isn't the victimization of vulnerable groups. The problem is that those vulnerable groups are, are complaining about their victimization. And similarly, not only the White Lives Matter kind of uh, hashtag, but the Blue Lives Matter hashtag in response to Black Lives Matter, attempts to reframe the question once again and um, doing the classic kind of gaslighting move um, that that happens in this situation of, of, of framing the, the the victim as the perpetrator and the perpetrator as the victim so suddenly the the, the police who are killing vulnerable people start being narrated as the um, as the victims and of course this this then dovetails perfectly with the what what, what the, that author was writing about the police training the police are were made to think of themselves as vulnerable as under attack as needing to use lethal force um to to prevent any possibility that they could come under attack by members of the public and 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 the blue lives matter hashtag precisely um um 
articulates that. It 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 it, it re-expresses that paranoid um, uh, mentality. But of course, it 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 does it in a particular way, rather than saying, well, in fact, U.S. police are vulnerable because members of public are walking around with like military assault weapons. Um, it completely fails to address that, and instead um, becomes a, a technique for trying to silence the victims of police brutality rather than addressing the causes of police vulnerability, which, which, are, which, which have a totally different origin. And so we see these, the, the, these, these kind of reactionary uh, movements, Black Lives Matter, um, All Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, um, as, 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 as reactive to this kind of emerging recognition of the violence against vulnerable people, and 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 it's an example of a of a consistently repeated pattern of of uh, sort of ignoring, silencing, denying vulnerability of actual victims, and then painting perpetrators or people who have a vested social interest in those systems of equality as being the actual victims. And as we go through the course, we'll see that this doesn't only happen with respect to police brutality. In fact, it happens across multiple patterns of violence in society.